the difficulty of getting something accepted in a culture which isn't used to it and has been observed by, for instance, the Sufi teacher Al-Ghazali, who died in 1111 AD, nearly a thousand years ago, when he said, you can't teach anybody anything that is not already part of their belief system, or words that effect. He's, and he also said, which I quote you for interest here, he said, for example, this is a man talking in the 12th century, he said, for example, if I were to tell you, and he's obviously addressing an audience in this book, and it must be written down from a lecture which he gave, he said, now if I were to stand up and tell you that there were a thing as small as a tiny grain, which, if you exploded it in a town, would completely destroy that town so that no trace of that town would, or of that thing would be left, who would believe me? That was before 1111 AD. And of course he was right, nobody believed him then, did they? Well, that's exactly the same thing happened. I had a bit of transparent plastic when I was in the Sudan. I showed it to a camel man. I didn't do a tribesman for the anthropologist present. Now he said, it's interesting, or worse than this effect, this is interesting, but it has no future in it. You can't wear it, I mean, how would you? It wouldn't keep the glare out if I used it for a window in my tent. So it, I couldn't sell him this bit of plastic as it were, at any price. Well, this cuts both ways. The problem is almost exactly the same, of course, as it is with the Hadendoa tribes in the West, that the people in the West consume our materials. They read our books, millions of words. They discuss them endlessly. I have um, 240,000, 243,000 letters uh, on file, of which 70,000 originate from the United States, in response to what I published alone in the last few years. You, know, you can imagine now, this is a terrific thing going on, but to what extent is what we are saying proving itself to be of interest to the receiving culture, as it's called? You might say it's up to us to interest you, you know. So if you're so clever, how come you're not rich, as I believe the saying goes, <laughs> okay, if this stuff is so terrific, how? <laughs> show me. Well, I feel it's necessary. Everything takes a minimum time, like time and pomegranates. I'll give you another story here to show you how we use these stories. And there's a story about fish. There's this fellow went to, again to a Sufi and he says, teach me exercises. And the Sufi said, no, I'm going to teach you a story instead. And then you won't need exercises. He says, there was once a man who agreed to train a fish whom he once met, uh, which he went jumped out of the water as he was passing a stream, trout probably, um, to live out of water. A fish said, what I want is to be able to live out of water. That's all I want. So the man said, all right, I'll teach you to live out of water. So the fish was absolutely desperate and he begged him. So the man said, all right, this kind-hearted man. And he took this fish and he took him out of the water for milliseconds at a time and then for hundreds of a second and then for tenths of a second and then for so on, seconds. Finally, the fish was able to breathe on the air. And the fish, in fact, went to live in his garden and put him in a nice damp place. And this rather low-lying garden, which was where, you know, where it got damp. And the fish was delighted. And every day we used to say things like, you know, this is what I really call living, you know. I am, this is real life. A fish living out there. The man was happy. He had a fish for a pet. The fish was happy. Everybody was happy. People said, what a clever man to train that fish. What a lovely fish. And so on and so forth. They became vegetarians. All kinds of things happened. Well, until one day, the garden was flooded and the fish was drowned. <laughs> now, we laugh at this story and it says, watch out, you know, don't try to be something you're not. This is the counsel of pessimism, isn't it? Or is it the, do we feel relief? You know, we're not like that fish, we're not that stupid. You know, laughter, they say, comes from relief, but identifying it with the victim, but knowing that one isn't really falling out of a 90-story block or whatever it is. Can the story be used for something else? Yes. There are several uses, and it all depends on the condition of the person to whom you're talking or with whom you're working as to what you bring out of this story. For example, I might say to you, yes, but this story is only referring to fish. It doesn't refer to you. You are not a fish, number one. Alternatively, we might say, fish is a condition. 
here, so it's being used as a condition. You are in fish condition. That man was in fish condition in relation to that teaching master who said to him, I won't give you an exercise, I'll tell you a story, because the story tells you that the man is effectively a fish. In other words, cannot profit by the exercise. But it also leaves the door open to him not to be a fish. Because the whole thing is a sham anyway. I mean, there is no real fish there. So presumably the man can change. He couldn't if he was, in fact, a fish. Couldn't even understand the story. So this is some of the sophistication which we bring to this kind of material. The essential thing is to be innocent about this material. You see, if you want to start talking about these stories and taking them to pieces, you get like the, the, the child who took the fly to pieces and he, he had the wings and the legs and the body and the head and so on, but did wonder where the fly had gone. This is very marked in the West, that people think that by demolishing something you can understand it. You mustn't divide the thing too small. You must be prepared to take, say, the fish story and divide it several times and look at it from various points of view and regard all of them as valid. You come to me, you say, give me an exercise, master, and I say, you are not ready, my child, I will tell you the story of the fish. And I then say, you see, as the fish was, so are you. He wasn't ready, you're not ready. Then if you come back with a wisecrack of riposte, ah, but I am not a fish, then you have won the interchange, but you haven't learned anything with the stuff that I'm supposed to be teaching you. You've abolished me by your wisecrack. You've abolished my role. So it has been a trial of wits, hasn't it? Who can win? So it was not a in fact, an education or learning or an interchange experience at all. And that's what I am complaining about. They used to call them wiseacres. I don't know if you used to use the word, it's still in the dictionary. A wiseacre is somebody who tries to appear wise, who wisecracks, actually. And that wisecracking, although I love it, has to be set aside before one can learn from stories in this way. Now, I've said two things here, haven't I? I've said that the the, the usefulness of the stories can be abolished very rapidly if you regard them just as moral tales. There is a moral, we are all fish or some such thing, which is Aesop, or as a wisecrack. Ha ha, he wanted he that fool in the old man, the Zen master type of character telling him about the fish got rid of him. So. I think that if we look at it more constructively, we do find, I believe, that this attitude is not always in order to abolish the impact and pr protect yourself from new information or from new impacts or from experience. I don't think it's always that. I think it is partly the child dismembering the fly or the insect. I think it partly is a very laudable desire to get to the bottom of it and understand it, to analyze it. It's a sort of analytical mania because that's very easily taught. We've all been taught it. The difference between you and me is that I was taught it and got over it very early and I don't know about you. I'm still capable of doing it to some extent, sequential thinking to some extent. I'm still capable of thinking from A through B or even Z to some extent. I don't claim any more. These stories are very often productive of much more. I mean, they are therapeutic, for example. Nobody knows that. And if you say it, it sounds rather like a sophistry on the lines of, you know, they have wonderful things in the East, the magic story which makes you well. Or else people say, well, tell me, how, 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 how? I mean, we know what antibiotics do. What is your, your, your so clever, how come you're not rich or how does it work? So I have to take refuge in the other side of the brain, <laughs> clearly here. But I must say, we do have this, this situation in which these stories appear to have some sort of a therapeutic effect on people. Rather like the Chinese used to believe that if you make somebody laugh, you make him better. You can cure it. You can help make the whole man better by getting him to laugh. And the Chinese still do say, well, thank you for making me laugh. But they're not primarily employed as a therapy, because the people who use these stories are not therapists. You may think that's rather odd. You might say, well, that's a sort of pre-scientific thing. I mean, hang it all, you've got a therapy here and you're not using it. Why don't you detach it? Well, we say, detach the therapy from the stories. Well, we say, ah, 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 that way lies detaching the wings from the fly. And some of us aren't going to do it. I, for one, living a lot of my time in the West, am quite sure that, not that we are incompetent or, or you are competent of 
isolating valuable things out of this and applying them, but rather that it will be destroyed. The whole formula will be destroyed if this method of approach is adopted. Therefore, one has to go back to the stories, one has to learn from the stories, has to read the stories. If you torture your brains, rack your brains, what does this story mean? Or if you get somebody to read this and it just laps over you like an oceanless sea or whatever it's called, you'll get nothing out of it. Because such people are, are quite useless in that state of mind to learn anything. I mean, imagine trying to buy a hamburger that way, even, you see, you can't do it. So those people may think themselves the avant-garde or the people who, who can learn from it. I read a story and I was transfixed, or I read a story and I felt nothing, or I read a story and I was taken away from myself. So these are the byproducts. These are the spin-off. These are the things which we do not find central to the study of these stories. So we provide you with the stories and hints, as it were, how they're used, such as I'm telling you now, with examples, with experiences. Much more exists in the published materials. Hundreds of these stories. You provide something. That which you provide is a different approach than you are accustomed to. I mean, you're accustomed in your life to goal orientation. I gotta get more money, or I've got to get this person cured, or that child taught, or this bacon home, or whatever you have to do. Well, be my guest, have a rest. Do something else. <laughs> Study these stories and the published material from another point of view where you don't have this compelling urgency which is going to produce these ulcers, or which you will then have to try to cure either by the same method or by some equally improbable or more improbable therapy, perhaps imported from the East. So what we have to do is discover a middle ground, a way of looking at this sort of stuff by exclusion as much as inclusion. By excluding uh, imagination about it, association of ideas all the time, the desire to smash your way through to truth or to apply it instantly, all these things, remembering that this material is not central to you. You've already got your jobs, your interests, your primary objectives, so you can add an extra component here as to whether this can be said in a country and a civilization which tends to invite people to have one objective and to do one thing and to do it at all costs, I myself don't know. It can be done certainly in other cultures, including those in the West and certainly including those in the East which have now got to such a state in many parts of the East where the culture is so impoverished that nobody wants to do anything at all except get loans from America or something like that. So if it can be done in parts of the East, and then I think it can certainly be done in the West. Now, the stories also enable you. They are a, a, um, certainly a psychological system which has enabled me and some of my colleagues, friends, and associates to understand as much as we do understand, I think, of the people in the West and how they think, as well as our own people. It really has helped. It's a terrific diagnostic and educational tool for us as we've been able to use. We've been able to see, and I think had we been in touch with you centuries ago, we would have been able to see it earlier, like you might have heard Al Ghazali in 1111 about the tiny thing which exploded. We have been able to see hang-ups and pluses and minuses in Western society, which you have also seen in some cases, and in other cases you have been able to do little about. One of the most valuable aspects of these stories is to help us if not overcome hypocrisy, at least to maintain a double system. That is to say, well, we have to be hypocritical in this Western appearance culture where I have to, I have to stand here and talk for a certain amount of time. I have to look relatively clean. If I'm a Hindu guru, I have to speak in broken English to you. In this appearance culture, as I call it, which is a hypocrisy culture, when they say that hypocrisy makes life easier, you know, you say, how are you? So nice to see you. You say that because if you said, I hate the sight of you, everybody would feel unhappy. Although it's only a convention, really. Because if you'd started off with saying, I hate the sight of you to pe people, then it would have become sufficiently established for you to maintain a viable society. However, I'm not attacking that society. I'm simply saying that it has enabled us to look at, to maintain the two tiers. We call it be in the world, but not of it. To be able to see somebody or something or people's behavior, for example, and to know whether that is learnt behavior, superficial, automatistic or not. Now, here's a little story uh, which will show you that, and which I tend to remember rather a lot. A man went to his Sufi teacher and he says to him, Look, I have a neighbor, and this man makes my life a misery by visiting me at all hours, hanging about the house, and constantly asking questions. 
Well, the teacher Sufi says, there's nothing easier than a cure for this. The man is making himself a nuisance to you, you can't get rid of him. All you have to do is to ask him for money every time you see him. And he'll soon start to avoid you. And for supposing he goes around spreading the word that I'm just trying to get money out of him. Ah, said the wise man, I see you're trying to control the thoughts of mankind, not trying to get rid of your neighbor. <laughs> it's perfectly true. Now you remember that, and you apply it to your life and to that of others, and you'll soon be able to operate in the two tiers, and hopefully, one day, the other tier will overtake the one we don't like, the hypocritical one. We'll be able to be ourselves to one another. Before that, of course, perhaps we may have to be better people before we can afford to be ourselves. But nevertheless, the option must be kept open. The possibility must be represented. The theory must be alive, must be somewhere. What is the story doing? It, it's trying to get you to enlarge your horizons and put you at your disposal an instrument for measuring yourself, the world, and situations. So you can use this therapeutically, you can use it for amusement, and you can use it for education. Well, it has to have its own requirements fulfilled, as I've just told you, but it's optimum application, because if you don't use it as an instrument, it will start to use you. So you might just become a teller of stories. If you can't interpret them, if you can't tell them at the right time, or if you simply dine out on it, as it were, then you are a failure in one way, although you may be a terrific success in another, a raconteur. The introduction of this material into the West has already uh, produced byproducts and hybrids. There are people telling stories all over the place, reading them to one another, explaining what they're like, and um, generally cutting into the market for my books in the most depressing manner. So I'll give you a commercial on that now, which is in the form of a story about this hybridization. You've probably all heard this story, it was a Western story, and that's why I love it, because I like to find, as I've, you've already learned, my material from other people, because that reassures me it's nothing better that the Rolls Royce is better than something I could make myself. So there's this fellow who crossed a carrier pigeon with a parrot, remember? And so that his offspring could speak the message in, instead of having to carry a written one. But the bird which was produced, there was one, hatched out of this experiment. He took hours instead of minutes to cover the ground. The man says, why did you take so long? Ah, oh, said the superior parrot. It was such a beautiful day that I walked. <laughs> so you see what's happened to the function. <laughs> Mind you, you've got a happy parrot there, you've got a superior bird. But the function is gone. And that, I think, is what has happened to Aesop. Aesop's fables, myself. And they've been trivialized. And many other things rather like that. What we have to do, because of Aesop, because of the way Hans Anderson or Aesop or Cinderella or anything are treated, just these few ways by psychoanalysis or wise saws or keep the children quiet or to inculcate a moral. Isn't it interesting to find that Aesop said such and such, just like today. And because of this trivialization, we have to restore the idea of dimensions in stories and dimensions in their uses. Do not think that by taking the stories and looking for various angles on them that you will be trivializing them. You won't. You can be your own teacher in this way up to a point. You can learn a very great deal. It's only if you take up one or two of these stereotype positions, wisecracking positions or consumer positions towards the stories that you won't be able to benefit from. Them. You can only enlarge yourself by laying bare for yourself the ground plan or the dimensions of these stories. But as long as you've been told, ah, oh, well, Red Riding Hood always, uh, Red Riding, what does Red Riding Hood teach? I mean, let's face it, it teaches. If you've got a wolf for a grandmother, you get everything you deserve, or one of those sort of things. Well, so it is this dimensions. Remember, there is a spectrum of reality. We believe there is a whole spectrum of reality to which these stories lead. Many people disagree with me and say, how can it be so? Um, it's a catchy idea, but I don't see it. Lots of people think that it's too hard to do and they don't want their fun spoiled. Well, those people are not the people to whom we're talking, quite obviously. I mean, it is a free country. <laughs> and you can't give everybody everything and nobody really wants to take everything. And if you find yourself answering in that way, then you have identified yourself. You've defined yourself. 
It's perfectly all right. Of course, people have come to me and said, I've read these stories, and I thought they were magnificent. And then when I started to analyze them and lay them bare and look at them and this and that and the other, I felt terrible afterwards. Well, they are describing themselves and not the stories. I mean, this is rather like saying, this is a funny knife, you know. I used to cut bread with it, and now I find I cut my throat with it. Well, <laughs> you have missed the point. Of course, we put it in a rather more poetic way, which is, um, if you fall asleep in a kennel, do not ask in the morning why you have woken covered in fleas. However, the stories which we've published, this is the first time I've ever talked about stories in this way and in this depth. These stories which we have published constitute a whole corpus, a whole body of material. There are no more to complete this, this body of material. There are hundreds of them, and it is uh, the work of centuries. So it is very useful. All the dimensions are there. But they will continue to be used in a, a trivialized manner, in a secondary manner. And I want to say that I don't mind, of course, if that happens, as long as some people use them in some other way. I was speaking to a British post office official, not the one that sent the parcel to the... <laughs> that I was telling you about. And I was saying to him something about, you know, it's such a pity that so many stamps get wasted or something, they're bought and not used. He said, we should worry, we make a profit on that, don't you understand? We are not only here in the business of delivering letters, we are here for the business of making money out of it, or at least not going under. So, similarly, I suppose if I couldn't get a commercial publication for my books, the material wouldn't get out at all. But, not long ago, you know, I was in a... I've spent an awful lot of time in England, although I do go to the Middle East a great deal. And I was in the, um, the guest of a Middle Eastern sort of potentate character, who shall be nameless. And I'm sitting in this palace that he has, they have palaces for anybody who comes, basically. And he says, um, people came, is there anything you want? And I said, yes, I'd like to listen to the radio. So this fellow withdrew. There was nothing in the place, really, because they bring you everything as you wanted, and then they take it away. So. So he said, yes, what would you like to hear? So I said, the BBC World Service News. So it's just happening. What time is it? Seven o'clock. Okay. So the following morning, two men arrived with the most fantastic radio receiver I'd ever seen, an extra antennas and this and that, most advanced thing. Where would you like it? I said, I'll just have it over there. I said, all right then. So one man sighted the set, the other one stood by. They put on his earphones and he's twiddling and so on. The man who is in charge has got his watch on. Seven o'clock goes like that. The man switches over to the loudspeaker from the from the earphones, and there is the London calling the stirring tune, Lily Bolero, that they always play. Is the London calling? This is London. So I listen to the London. They're looking at me, operating the set. One's the other one's looking at me. When it was over, the one who the chap who was in charge of the other said, uh, is, "Will there be anything else?" And I said, "No, very well." They took the radio set because it went up. So. After I had my breakfast, which I'd already arranged to bring, and it was brought and taken away, of course, like everything else, I went to see my host. He was sitting there. Have you had breakfast? Yes, thank you. Very well. What have you been doing this morning? Here? Have you been out shooting or something? No, I have been listening to um, the BBC on this uh, set, which your people kindly brought me. But um, I said to him, you know, uh, it's very kind of them, but they might have just left it there. I could have heard something else, you know. I could have twiddled. Now he said to me, oh, my dear fellow, he says, because he was educated in England like a lot of these other characters. My oh, dear fellow, said, you must not blame us, but rather the fact that you are spending rather too much time in the West. Why on earth did you not tell my chaps that you only wanted to twiddle? Then they would have left the radio for you. You told them that something specific and they did it. So, I mean, you know, I just thought that if people, it's perfectly true, here he is, he's behaving more Western than some of the Westerners, and he knows the difference between when you want to twiddle and when you want to get something done. I hope we all know the difference, and I certainly hope that anybody who wants to twiddle with any of these stories will do so, because it increases my royalties and those of, of others who are writing in this field. But it is important to know the difference, because that is your history and that is your destiny. This is our human civilization story. It first started out when we learned the difference between Ankh and Og, or something like that, or Adam and Eve, and so on, and so forth, down to a certain sort of subdivision and the capacity not to subdivide. 
So this is this question of twiddling. Now, there is another very important value in these stories, and Dr. Desmond Morris, who wrote The Naked Ape, has referred to this in relation to these stories when he pointed out that when you familiarize yourself with them, you may not get much more out of them than the obvious superficial meaning, but he said after reading them, he started to recognize situations in his life which corresponded very much with the structure of these stories. In other words, many of us have experiences which are repeating situations which occur to us again and again, but we don't know the structure. And because we don't know the structure, we very often can't handle the situation. This is what Jason Morris said, and he holds that these stories do help you to handle situations in this way. There are now lots of people who are claiming that these particular stories do have that effect. And I'm quite sure that this is true, but it's going into, into the wildest areas. I mean, I just noticed their report of the second Coral Gables Conference on Symmetry Principles in High Energy has come out illustrating principles of physics which can't be illustrated in any other way except by some of these stories which are published on every other page to illustrate recondite concepts of physics. So you, you never know where it may lead us in the end. If you want to get into physics, maybe that's one, one way to do it. I'm not so good even at arithmetic myself, but there you are. The effects of some of these stories do seem to trap a sequential brain uh, mode and by striking a kind of blow at it, tip you over into the holistic. And I've noticed this in these stories again and again, and I've also noticed an equivalence because I know the stories in ordinary life. I always wondered how it was, for instance, that people can paralyze others. I, I remember hearing a schoolboy listening to another schoolboy. One of them was very loquacious, very intelligent, very, very, and he was arguing something out rationally and logically, and the other schoolboy couldn't keep up, you know. And when this brilliant character paused for a moment and said, well, what do you think of that? The other one said, go and knit yourself a slice of cake. And this paralyzed the, this great intellectual. He couldn't think of it, so he started to fight the first one. He went back into this <laughs> holistic mode, as you might say. And so one has since then often seen this in real life, as it were, in adulthood rather, that how a certain sort of story or event will switch a person from one mode to the other, and they tend to rationalize it subsequently. They, they don't notice it at the time unless they are possessed of this information, but uh, we would have not called it switching from the holistic to the sequential or vice versa. We would have simply said that it, it, this is a blow which changes your way of thinking. And they do in fact do so. It happened to me once. I, I had a terrible time with a fellow who was uh, outthinking me, right, left and center. Terrible intellectual, he's very, very clever, and I couldn't hardly do a thing with him. So in answer to something he said, I said, well, you know, you fellows are all the same, and you think just because Freud said that somebody's grandmother bit him in the womb, you know something or something like that. And this completely paralyzed him. He could never, uh, there was a great howl of laughter from everybody else in the room because they thought that was very funny. And he was just staggering about and saying, but you can't say that. It's physically impossible. And because, here's this man with his great intellect. So it has got its uses. You see, if you can't keep up, you can always blackjack him <laughs> with one of these stories. <laughs> so remember, all is not lost. I mean, I, I know, I don't want to make a joke about remedial education. Uh, but I would like to say that as one who is not possessed of all the greatest possibilities of man, I would like to say, a woman or a child, I would like to say that um, I like to be possessed of a, a, an instrument to get myself out of situations where I can't keep up. And I think that is a thing which has been learned by many of us who are not apparently handicapped, <laughs> a, way, a way of winning a situation. How to win even if you're no good, shall we say. And these stories do, do help in that. Uh, you might call it lifemanship, but after all, we often have to survive in ordinary life. We are living in the hypocritical society. If I am employed by somebody and uh, I can't keep up, it's no use saying I wouldn't tell a lie or I wouldn't use lifemanship or I wouldn't do that because I'm too good, because who's going to feed my wife and children if I'm too good? That's the society we are living in, so we can't spurn. Uh, techniques which will help us to keep our end up. These stories do help on that, and remember, it's not training you to be like that, it's optional. You don't have to do any of these things. Even, believe it or not, I've used this myself in the West, in the, the idea of the Eastern mystical master, you see. Now, we have a lot of stories, teachings, and all sorts of encounters, all kinds of stuff, which 
stripped of their oriental or eastern colouring, are not dramatic enough to interest people in the West. So I have maintained a great deal of this stuff only because Western people, without knowing it, are themselves brought up on a Middle Eastern tradition, Judeo-Christian, to, uh, to put it no higher. They are full of Oriental stories, the people in the West, and uh, they don't know it. And they respond to that kind of thing. So this is something which I have learned from the stories themselves and from my early training, and that is you mustn't be too far ahead or behind the people you're dealing with. Now, this is another thing which the stories themselves teach you. What we've been able to do is, we've been able to reconstitute the emphases of the stories. So instead of there being instruments only to make you think how great the spiritual master is and how wonderful, how nothing you are, and how wonderful the possibilities of the situation are, we have retrieved the dynamic of the stories in most cases in order to show, aside from those things, what is possible. So, you can hardly call it a, a metaphysic, you can really call it a spiritual path if a spiritual path is wallowing in emotion. We call it the spiritual path, but that's an entirely different subject. In order to try to reclaim that element, we have reintroduced the aversion therapy element, so that the people who believe that mawkish sentimentality is something to do with God, hate us. <laughs> that enables us to go on with our job. In order to show you how you may find a versatility in our... Um, approach, you will see in our stories that our spiritual and mystical masters and so on very often behave not as far out as these Zen masters who deny everything and refuse to be spiritual and all that kind of thing, but there's something in between, shall we say. And I think there's a very good example of a story here. I'm telling you this one because it has a very strong basic similarity to situations which exist in everyday life. There was once one of these spiritual masters in the East, and he dressed his disciples in robes of wool, and he had them carry begging bowls made out of sea coconuts, and taught them to whirl in a mystic dance, and he intoned passages from certain classics, and there they were, they were really in business. And once a philosopher asked him, now what would you do as a spiritual teacher if you went to a country where there were no sheep for the wool, where there were no sea coconuts, dancing was considered immoral, and you weren't allowed to teach the classics? And he then said, well, of course, in such a place, I would work by finding a completely different kind of disciple. Now this is something the, the like of which you do not find in Western thinking and in the theologized psychological teaching of the East. We are trying to restore this middle way between materialism, you might say, and supposed spirituality in which we are unable to discern spiritual ingredients for your information, however, whatever turns you on. Now, Jalaluddin Rumi, our great teacher of the 13th century, to whom I so often refer, said in this connection, I am the slave of whoever will not at each stage imagine that he has arrived at the end of his goal. Many a stage has to be left behind before the traveler reaches his destination. We can run through a number of contentions about education as understood by the Sufis and represented both in their literature, in their stories, and in their traditional ways of communicating materials and inducing experiences to note both what is new and familiar and what may fall into the interstices of contemporary educational activity. Time lag between exposure to impacts and their absorption, together with the fact that people often abolish the impact of a story effectively by fending it off with a wisecrack or a riposte, or call it what you like, may make for acceptable social behavior, but it can also make for lack of sensitivity in the teaching situation. Attention to these factors is a part of our expertise and interest. The need to monitor one's own reactions and to see why one is behaving in a certain way. Self-observation without neurotic self-abasement, oh dear, what am I doing? may be taken as the next important feature of our studies. Even at the very early stage of time lag, wisecrack and self-study, we can easily note how difficult it is for some people to get the measure of what they're doing, how one may not know one's own time lag characteristics, how one may wisecrack automatically, unable to control this response, how one may dive into an orgy of introspection. What am I doing? Why am I not learning? For this reason, the monitoring of the Sufi teacher may be said to be so necessary as to justify the institution of teachership on its own. That is, the monitoring by this teacher. We have done all we can 
to embody as much of this teachership function as we can in the literature itself which we've published and largely we've been able to do this by excluding a lot of the extraneous and external accretions. The attachment to externals, esteeming the container and not the content, is also a major human tendency and a further explanation for the presence of, or at least the effect of, the teacher or the institution of teachership and or the instrument of teaching. Observation of the barriers takes two forms. You can see it in the stories and or in oneself. The, um, the barriers may be so ingrained through habit that there's a need for an operation almost of some kind, an exposure to an interchange, which you sometimes may be more familiar with in the Zen tradition, for these barriers to yield, even temporarily. Now, we've already noted that barriers cannot be dealt with by mechanical structures, by repeatedly telling people not to be subjective, for instance. This merely makes the determination not to be subjective ingrained as a sort of characteristic in itself. It does not impart the quality of being able to do what one thinks one should be doing. Indirect teaching and the accumulation of a number of impacts or teachings to make up a single whole is another feature of Sufi study. What is called in some disciplines enlightenment can be, in the Sufi process, the result of the falling into place of a large number of small impacts and perceptions producing insights when the individual is ready for them. It's what you call experience in your world, but uh, you may not have developed it quite to the extent to which others have. The fact that one may be learning bit by bit and storing up little pieces of information and experience which are, almost insensibly, to come together at some later date, naturally does not recommend itself to people who may be offered something which it's claimed will give them instant insights. Hence the grasping for catch-all categories of teachings which always claim to be comprehensive. Sufi study therefore cannot hope to compete with instant illumination systems. Just as I believe you used to have similar nostrums here, they were called snake oil, people used to sell from the back of wagons. To us, we read these systems off rather like you would nowadays, snake oil. Yet the drop-by-drop -drop activity of Sufism does cause a certain amount of restlessness, even among those who accept the postulates which I have already mentioned. Hence, it is often found that people complain that their studies are not proceeding along the lines which they believe to be indicated as in the case of the Tattoo Lion story, for instance. Well, the foregoing questions, too, are tied up in the educational event by the problem of attention. People who have a portion of their attention attached to something other than the subject under study will often, it is held by us, be virtually disabled from absorbing the lesson. This has naturally been distorted into the claim that people must marshal and focus every iota of attention before they can learn. And, of course, this is the doctrine of one aspirin will cure a headache, so a thousand will give me higher consciousness. But the nature, quality, and degree of attention is held by the Sufis to be as important as the more easily quantified input in learning situations. Traces of this doctrine of a psychological mean, a movement between two extremes of opinion, belief or exercise, are indeed to be found here and there in Western literature, although seldom linked with any teaching situation. And that is really what interests me very much indeed, working as I do so much in the West. People will campaign against immodesty with little result other than self-abasement, which may be worse when pursued in excess, as I, for instance, found in Shakespeare, which is a marvelous mine of knowledge of both the banal and the deeply perceptive, as when he said, for instance, in Henry V, self-love is not so vile as self-neglecting. When the other requirements are being observed, there are still more which have to be kept in balance from our point of view. People who, for instance, are accustomed to hearing stories as something to make them laugh, to inculcate a moral or to illustrate a point of doctrine, often find that they're unable to look and listen for other ranges of meaning in a story. We have to watch for that. Now, these people are described by Sufis as not learners at all, at least not when they're at that stage and in that condition. They are seen to be people who are attuned to moralizing or jokes or dogma. This is why Sufis so often seem to be asking people whether they really are Sufis, or whether 
they are students of someone else or devotees of something else. Sufis require attention to what they're teaching in the spirit in which they're teaching it, no less than in the case of more conventional instructors or teachers in anything. You must get the tone, you must have the focus, you must be interested in the subject, in the way in which it is being presented, otherwise you will not be able to receive the communication. Similarly, people who come to consume or to be emotionally stimulated, whether by the presence of the teacher or the unfamiliarity, the strangeness of the materials, the, the doctrine, are not regarded by us as uh, students at all. Certainly not in our sense, they may be students of something, but not of what we are teaching. So it might be said that people are always trying to test the genuineness of the teacher and the teaching, but some of us have found that there are many more fake uh, students than there are fake teachers. 